Could the devil exist? Note that I did not ask, does the devil exist? I asked, could the devil exist? But for clarity's sake, I will answer both questions. Does the devil exist? If by that you mean does the epitome of all evil, as described in the Judeo-Christian tradition, exist somewhere out there in the cosmos or in hell beneath us, then I would have to say no. In my opinion, the devil does not exist. But could the devil exist? Could a devil-like entity be brought into being? Could the devil cross over from the realm of myth into the material world? I would say it is certainly more likely. I envision two scenarios where this could happen. One pathway is through artificial intelligence. I have speculated in past videos about the idea of birthing a devil or antichrist-like figure via AI, namely in my videos on the game Soma. If we go with the theory that human consciousness is computational, maybe there is an algorithmic recipe for the devil. The second pathway is through some combination of eugenics and psychological manipulation. Though, the recipe for that would not be as scientifically reliable, but maybe not impossible. Thankfully, we do not have the scientific or medical knowledge that would produce such a being. But there has been fictional speculation. One example is with the eugenically produced character Johann Liebert from Naoki Urasawa's masterpiece, Monster. Though I am a relative newcomer to the world of anime and manga, my understanding is that, aside from Griffith, the lead antagonist of the Berserk series, Johan is widely recognized as the greatest villain of both mediums. And in my opinion, rightly so. At the very least, you can reliably expect to see Johan on all the top 10 lists of anime and manga villains. It is near impossible to list every reason why Johan merits his place on those lists. Those who have read or watched Monster know that Johan's evil is one that is easier to intuit rather than explain. But I can use a metaphor that will give you a general idea. Imagine every negative trait that you can. Deceit, Betrayal, resentment, hatred. Recall the times in your life that you have felt the most extreme form of those emotions. Now imagine all of those traits were a color. Now imagine that an artist threw all those hundreds of colors at a canvas. Eventually, all those colors would congeal into a singular blackness, and that blackness would be Johan. If you have never watched the anime or read the manga, the language I just used might seem overzealous or melodramatic. But those who have experienced the story of Monster know that the words I have chose were done for the sake of accuracy, and not exaggeration. Like the hypothetical artist who projects every color onto the canvas, I and many other viewers are inclined to project every negative trait onto Johan, just as religious folk do with the devil. But unlike the devil, Johan, at least in the reality of Monster, is real. I wonder, what knowledge of evil did Urasawa possess that allowed him to birth the devil in his story? How did he manage to write Johan in such a way that he would reliably compel the deepest feelings of disgust and horror from his audience? Finally, the most terrifying question of all is whether it is possible to replicate a personage like Johan in the real world? I will attempt to answer all of those questions, but in order to do so, first I will introduce one of Urosawa's potential inspirations, one that, seemingly, many fans of Monster have overlooked for the past few decades. It is from that source of inspiration that we might be able to glean some of the ingredients for that recipe of evil, and how those ingredients constitute Johan's psychology. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. The overlooked form of inspiration is hinted at in episode 59 of the anime and chapter 124 of the manga. Here, we see Johan introduced to the other main villain of the series, Peter Chapek, a bureaucrat in league with white supremacists. This meeting was made possible by the character Eva Heinemann, a character who manages to find herself tied up with all the other main characters in the story. 
She pointed Johan out to Chepak at a party. Later that evening, after the party ends, Ava describes the meeting of these two men to one of Chepak's henchmen, Martin Reist. She describes that meeting as bringing together Mephistopheles and Faust. Unless you're German, or a connoisseur of the arts, you're likely not going to understand that reference. Faust and Mephistopheles are characters from a German play titled Faust. Faust is one of the most influential works of German literature, written by a man who is essentially the German Shakespeare. His name is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, a man who just so happens to share the same first name as Monster's villain, and his middle name is the first name of a character named Grimmer. Faust is the story of a man who wishes to attain infinite knowledge. In order to attain said knowledge, Faust sells his soul to an evil spirit named Mephistopheles. What follows are the inevitable consequences of making any sort of deal with a devil or demon. There are many reasons why Faust sits at the foundation of both German literature and culture. One of which is the fact that the story of Faust was refined to perfection over the course of 60 years. The final version was only published after Goethe's death at the age of 82. I imagine that one of the many reasons he was reticent to publish a final version during his time alive was that he wanted to perfect his depiction of evil within the character of Mephistopheles. In order to understand how Goethe was able to write such an influential, despicable villain like Mephistopheles, it's important to keep in mind the culture that Goethe was a part of at the time and how that likely informed his writing. He was alive during the time of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment movement that that revolution birthed. This was the time when the Judeo-Christian doctrine which undergirded Western civilization was starting to be effectively challenged where age-old religious symbols like the god and the devil were starting to lose their potency, culminating in the Nietzschean death of God a century later. Goethe was influenced to a degree by these ideas. In regards to Christianity, he would draw upon Christian symbolism in his works, but he also despised the church. This is not to say that he had no interest in spirituality or religion, mind you. His views shifted broadly throughout his life his interests at one time or another embracing pietism, mysticism, the Kabbalah, alchemy, folklore, neoplatonism, liberalism, and many other vogues. Goethe's experience with all these traditions and their views on evil no doubt had an influence on his conception of Mephistopheles. Some might say that Mephistopheles, like Johann, can simply be understood as an analog for the Christian devil, but the reality is far more complicated than that. Rather, Mephistopheles is a synthesis of all the aforementioned traditions and their understanding of evil. Mephistopheles is much too complex, diverse, and ambiguous to be identified with the Christian devil. Goethe kept the ambiguity pronounced, as part of Mephisto's function is to deny any dichotomy in nature, moral or otherwise. Mephistopheles appears both as the opponent of God and as the instrument of the divine will, as the creator of the material world and as God's subject. Despite these and many other contradictory traits that Mephistopheles possesses, it is possible to gain a general understanding of him by, once again, introducing a metaphor. He is fundamentally a nature spirit, representing the undifferentiated world as it presents itself to human experience. He is an invitation to the reader to face the multiplicity of reality. That multiplicity reflects the painting metaphor I used before. He, like Johann, represents the blackness, the chaos, and all the negative traits that come along with it. The only purpose that chaotic force has is to negate all that is good or ordered. Mephistopheles says as much in what is arguably his most famous quote. When Faust asks Mephistopheles who he truly is, he replies, I am the spirit that negates. And rightly so, for all that comes to be deserves to perish wretchedly. Tor better nothing would begin. Thus everything that your terms, sin, destruction, evil, represent, that is my proper element.
If that quote and the previous descriptors were not enough to convince you of a connection between Mephistopheles and Johann, then consider the following. Both characters take on many different forms. Mephistopheles will take on the form of a wandering scholar, a magician, or even a poodle. Johann will dress up as his twin sister, and has even taken on other names like Franz Heinau, Michael Reichmann, and Eric Springer. One other form I neglected to mention that Mephistopheles took was that of the Emperor's Fool, which he did in order to urge disastrous social policies. I imagine Johann sought a similar type of destruction when he was aiming for control of Germany's economy, via the killing of Hans Schuwald and fraternizing with bureaucrats like Peter Chapek. The resemblance between both characters is uncanny, if for nothing else but for their core purpose. Unlike the vast majority of villains who commit evil deeds for either selfishness or what they view to be a noble cause, the sole aim of both characters is simply to negate to destroy, for it would be better that life never existed. What I have noticed in my time analyzing villains online is that the villains that tend to be the most terrifying are not the ones who believe they're doing good, though there are several villains of that sort that are frightening and compelling. The villains that I tend to see bolstered as the most terrifying include Heath Ledger's Joker, Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men, Alex DeLarge from A Clockwork Orange, or Pazuzu from The Exorcist. They all act as if they are instruments of a divine will, as if they are acting out the will of chaos itself. Johan is no different. He, like Mephistopheles, will use his slick intelligence and superficial charm in order to have people and institutions perish in the most wretched and painful ways. He will kindly draw you in with false impressions of love and concern, only to expose your greatest weakness to you in the hopes that you will commit suicide. He will burn down a library of priceless books, manipulate an orphaned child into believing he isn't loved, all because he wishes for this shitty existence to disappear. With both characters established, I return to the question that I asked at the beginning of this video. Could the devil exist? Though, given what I have just said, I think it would be better to reformulate the question to something like, could evil incarnate exist? Could Mephistopheles incarnate into someone like Johan in our reality? The exact recipe for such a being is unknown, but given how well Johan was written, it's worthwhile reviewing what made him into the person he is. Maybe by doing so, we can discover some clues once that will help us determine whether the results are replicable in reality. Just as Johann and Mephistopheles wish for nothing to exist, this wish extends to their own being. On numerous occasions in Monster, we see Johann attempt to erase his existence. There are two main methods he uses to do this. On the one hand, he attempts to kill everybody who knew him in life before he ultimately dies. This is kind of brilliant, because the only thing worse than having a killer get away with his heinous crimes is to not have a killer to blame those heinous crimes on. Even in a case where the killer got away with their crimes, like the Zodiac Killer, at least we have an image and a name to blame those killings on. In the case of Johan, he would have it so that the public would have to find a scapegoat, which ideally would be existence itself. You would have to curse existence for not only allowing such unimaginable and horrific crimes to take place, but for the killer to completely evade the eye of those who would wish to do good. The other way he attempts to erase his existence is by striving for namelessness. Though he goes primarily by the name Johan, it is clear to me that he does so merely for convenience. He not only wishes to be nameless, but he seems incapable of adopting a name, for he has no firm sense of identity. Any sense of identity was engineered out of him, before and after his birth. After all, he was born as a part of a eugenics experiment, one that would supposedly create a genetically superior being. A key component of making this experiment successful, apparently, would be making sure that he did not have a name. This is of the utmost importance. A name confers identity. Identity equates to individuality. And what confers our individual identity 
is that which makes us different from other individuals. How are your values different? How are your interests different? Those differential traits revolve like electrons around the central nucleus that is our name, our identity. Without a name or identity, without a sense of self, then what are you? You are nothingness. Now, what happens if you give that nothingness consciousness? You get a paradoxical being, like Johann or Mephistopheles. They exist, but yet they don't. They live, but only to destroy. They can take one form, but that isn't their soul form. It is this paradox of being that elevates Johann and others of his ilk to the realm of not just profundity, but also divinity. It is not unusual to see paradoxes as expressions of the divine in religion, for example. Unities of opposites, like Baphomet, divine hermaphrodites, like Ardana Rishvara, or the merging of mortal flesh and divine substance in Jesus Christ, this trait is reflected in the most infernal way, with Johann. Let us review how Johann achieved this paradoxical state of identity and non-identity. Again, in the earliest part of his life, he did not have a name. When Johann, his twin sister Nina, and his mother escaped the eugenics experiment, his mother ordered him to wear girls' clothes. This was done so that it would be more difficult for those operating the experiment to find the family and take them back. It seems to me that forcing feminine clothes onto Johann contributed to his confused sense of identity, so much so that it made him susceptible to confusing his own memories for his sister's memories. Recall the moment in the series where Nina is re-kidnapped and then returns after weeks of further experimentation. Nina relays her painful memories to Johan, and then Johan adopts those memories as his own. Finally, there is the children's book The Nameless Monster, written by one of the forerunners of the eugenics experiment, Klaus Poppe. This book, amongst other books, were written to brainwash certain children so that they could become the genetic superior desired by the eugenicists. This book, along with the emphasis on namelessness and confusion with his sister Nina, permitted Johann's self-erasure. But even though Johann had no, let's say, traditional nucleus of identity, he needed something. If he could not put faith in the reality of his own existence, he would have to put his faith in a different reality. Even when everything about the world around us is in a Cartesian sense of doubt, the one reality that is hard to argue against is the unpleasantness of our own pain. From Johann's birth, pain and all the emotions it produces was the only surefire thing. There was the pain of being a part of a eugenics experiment, the pain of not having a father figure, the pain of having a confused identity, but the worst pain of all for Johann, as we know, was the memory of his mother. When his mother was rediscovered by those who conducted the eugenics experiment, she was forced to give up one of her children. Over the span of a few seconds, she chose Johann, but then chose Nina. Johann, for his entire life, was left to wonder if his mother knew who she was choosing in that moment. Even though some might argue that the mother had to make an impossible, Sophie's Choice-like decision in that moment, and that she actually loved both children equally, that wouldn't negate the fact that this existence allowed for such a painful decision. Considering these circumstances, it is difficult to not feel sympathy for Johan. There are times in all of our lives where we are completely taken out by suffering, so much so that we contemplate suicide. At least in those cases, we have a center we can return to. We can turn inward and nurture our identity. We will clutch our values like cornerstones and choose to act morally, even in the most challenging situations. Then, we can work our way up from the bottom. But Johan has no identity. He was born in the Abyss. He is the Abyss. And the Abyss has no center. Could Johan exist? Could evil incarnate in someone like him? Theoretically, yes. We've come close, what with the mass murderers of the 20th century and many others throughout history. But even those men had values and identities. 
Thankfully, the exact circumstances to birth a mind like Johan's, natural or artificial, would have to be so precise that they might as well be impossible. Still, it's unnerving to think that such an effective and sophisticated form of evil could incarnate in our reality. If that were to happen, what would we do to save ourselves from evil's whims? Well, the series actually tells us. For all the things that Johan was able to account for, he could not account for what would happen at the end of Monster. He wanted the series protagonist, Dr. Tenma, to kill him. In doing this, he would complete what Nina referred to as his perfect suicide. Though Tenma, Nina, and a few others would attest to Johan's existence, it wouldn't be enough to prove that he was the committer of his crimes. In this moment, Tenma almost shot him, but instead, a local drunk pulled out a gun and shot him instead. But this wasn't the moment that Johan was unable to account for, though he certainly did not anticipate it. Rather, it was Dr. Tenma's decision following this incident. Dr. Tenma used his skills as the most talented neurosurgeon in the country to extract the bullet from Johan's head and save him. To perform a surgery like this on a single occasion is borderline impossible. In Tenma's case, he did it twice, and on the same person. Johan suffered the same gunshot wound to the head as a child, and was saved by Tenma. Consider the power of this deed for a moment. Granted, killing Johan would have been understandable and forgivable, given his monstrous deeds, but I wonder if that would have been the right decision. And I'm not talking about the side effects of killing Johan that might inflict Tenma's soul. I think that affirming the value of Johan's life, despite his deeds, and saving him from certain death twice, might be the miraculous act that would break Johan out of his nihilistic pit. To do so would demonstrate the eternal upper hand that love has over hate, how it could triumph over even the devil. And the choice to preserve life, even in the face of the infinite abyss, is a power that every human being possesses. Even if the devil could exist, we would all have the power to say no to his whims. We just have to hope that whenever our soul is on the line, that we, like Dr. Tenma, make the right decision.